Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chatting with Ron. It's a program that focuses on people doing amazing things with their lives. Some are authors, some are business or government leaders, and some are leading nonprofits, but all are in their own way, making the planet a better place. You can listen to Chatting with Ron in several ways. We're broadcast on WVLPFM radio, which is located in Valparaiso, Indiana, on Monday mornings from 8 to 8, excuse me, from 8 to 9 a.m., and Friday afternoons from 1 to 2 p.m. If you're in Valparaiso, it's 103.1 on your FM dial, or a better way is to stream it at their website, wvlp.org. By going to their website, you can also see that they're, what they're doing in the Valparaiso community, and you can be part of that. You can also underwrite this program by emailing the station manager, who's a really nice guy, named Greg Kovich at info at wvlp.org. You can also find this program in Apple Podcast, uh, Spotify, and there's half a dozen other places to find it. Wherever you're used to using listening to podcasts, you'll find Chatting with Ron. You can also enjoy the video on YouTube, same, same name under the, for the channel Chatting with Ron. If you uh, enjoy the podcast or the video, please consider subscribing to it. It's currently underwritten by me, Ron Bush Consulting Incorporated. And please check out my website, ronbushconsulting.com. Well, we have a great guest today. His name is Jim Cantarucci. He's the founder of Transition Management Advisors and is CEO of the software company Constituent Hub. Jim works closely with executive teams to help implement the strategies developed in the boardroom. He's the author of Change Project Management, The Next Step, The Skill Sets of a Change Leader, Seven Essentials for Emerging Leaders, and is also the author of Personal Brilliance. He writes to leaders every Saturday morning, so we're going to talk about that. Jim's work has been featured in the New York Times, The Economist, and Entrepreneur Magazine. Personal Brilliance, an Amazon bestseller, has been published in many languages throughout the world. So let's welcome Jim Cantarucci to explore how he's leaving a footprint with business and their leaders. Welcome, Jim. Hi, Ron. It's great to be with you. Looking forward to it. Oh, I'm, that makes two of us. So I'll get right into it. I know you've, required, you've acquired a specialty very early in your career. So let's start with that. Yeah, Ron, first, my first job, 19-year-old punk, uh, working full-time, but also going to school full-time at Ohio State. I have, a, I have a degree in finance, although I never have properly used it. Uh, but, but that was my first job. And honestly, I didn't know any better. Uh, w that company, while I was there, did 38 acquisitions. And wow. so they were rapidly growing and expanding. And my job was to go out into the field for the new acquisition and bring them into the fold and help them uh, integrate with what we were doing. I naively really thought everybody's job was like that. I didn't realize that I was leading large organizational change and helping with that. And then my second job was advising very large banks implementing a huge computer system. Again, very naive. I thought everyone's job was like this. I was so busy doing it. I didn't realize that it was a thing. I didn't know there were academics about leading change and project management and all of that stuff. I was too busy doing it, right? Uh, right. So once, <laughs> once I figured that out and I realized that it was a specialty and there, there, were, there was some art and science behind it, I decided to start my own firm. And that was way back in 1995. And the idea is to, to teach the process um, from a very practical perspective based on that experience and in, in doing it in, uh, in the real life of those companies that I was working with and then sharing with my clients. So that's, wow. that's really where that all came from. But I, I, I didn't know that it was a thing, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, change leadership is the focus, but you wrote a book about innovation. So yeah. where, where did we go with that? Yeah, well, Ron, I was always the guy that they kicked out front to tell everybody what was going on with these big changes. And again, naive, I didn't know that I was supposed to be afraid of that. I didn't know I was supposed to be scared of, <laughs> uh, of speaking to large groups. And so, um, you know, that I knew that speaking was going to be a part of what I did with transition management advisors with my, with my firm. And so that always was, was part of the mix. When, when working from a change leadership standpoint, I really focus on leaders. And so the audience, by definition, is relatively small, right? And there are fewer of them. And so in order to expand that audience, I, I thought, well, 
I, I really want to to start speaking about maybe something a little more broad, bigger. And so I gravitated towards innovation, which to me is the another side of the coin. They're very very much related. If you if you look upstream from change, uh, it's the innovation and the strategy that uh, generates that change. And so I just went a little bit farther up the chain and, and wanted to talk about, about innovation. And so um, rather than, um, than, than talk about innovation from a corporate standpoint, strangely, because that's where I worked a lot, right? I thought, what happens with my clients? What happens in those those situations that, that I'm living in every day. And what I observed was that there were extraordinary things being done by a small number of people and that a large group of people were just going through the motions, just punching the time clock, if you will. And I really wanted to get to the bottom of that. And so my take on the innovation equation, trying to come up with a unique perspective was to look at how do we work as individuals to be more innovative, to create a habit of innovation? And that's where the work personal brilliance came, in, came into play and, and pulling that together. So again, very much related, um, but I, I, I wrote the book and cre I actually created the speech first and then wrote the book afterwards, really to generate a bigger audience. And of course, with the book, I, I, I was found myself keynoting big conferences whose theme was innovation. It, it, you know, it made some sense. But um, I, I really wanted to take it from that standpoint. If, if we want to define personal brilliance, the way I define it is, if you're faced with a situation where you have to come up with and implement great ideas on a regular basis, and you can, mm -hmm. that's personal brilliance. And so uh, it really comes with from four catalysts, uh, I believe, and, and they are awareness, curiosity, focus, and initiative. And these are the things that I noticed were very strong in those extraordinary people that I worked with. Uh -huh. And so the natural traits were born with awareness, curiosity, focus, and initiative. We're born with it. It starts from, from birth. But the standard line, raise your hand before you ask a question, don't chew gum kind of rules we grow up with, tarnish those natural abilities. And personal brilliance was about polishing those up a bit. And so the idea was, for me, if we want our organizations, our companies to be more innovative, it's all dependent on the individuals that work for our company to be more innovative. They have to have a habit of innovation. All coming together makes our company more innovative. And that's really the, the perspective that I was seeing down on the street, uh, working in the, in, in the front lines. And so I wanted to do that with the book bring that together. And of course, it's so interrelated that I use that work in, in everything I do. So change, innovation, really, um, you know, all under the same umbrella, if, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. So I've got a logical question or an obvious question. In, in large corporations that I've worked for, oftentimes innovation is kept to a minimum. You don't want people that rock the boat. Uh, you don't want people that ask too many questions. Uh, you want people that just kind of go with the flow. Unfortunately, that kind of dampens the opportunity for innovation. And you, and you also have, um, in change leadership, I, mean, I guess it's easier to lead sheep when they go where you tell them to, but when they don't, um, maybe, maybe sometimes that's a good thing, I guess. How do you, how do you uh, ha handle that or how do you, have you encountered that? I guess let's start there. Well, sure, absolutely. And, and that idea of conformity and um, just following the rules is one of those things that dampen those natural characteristics that we have. And, and that's a reason why we have Dilbert cartoons and we uh, thank God it's Friday and we just can't wait for the weekend and hate to go to work. Uh -huh. Right. So when we think in terms of championship teams, truly um, championship teams, and if we use the sports analogy, that that year after year after year building a dynasty, that's mm -hmm. a great place to work. Right. And so that's what we're after. Now, not everybody can handle that. Now, we need average, I guess. I, I just don't want to work with those folks, right? Uh, if we're searching for that, that dynasty championship team, then we need every member of the team to be innovative. Now, one caveat, 
we're not necessarily always talking about inventing the light bulb. It could be a, a small tweak to our billing process or just a, a, a little uh, change to the formula in our product. That kind of innovation is what I'm talking about. And so if we have everybody working on that, then we don't, then an individual employee won't let something pass without improving it, without making it better, without creating a scenario where the, the strategy is, is moved forward like the senior executives hope it will. Uh, uh -huh. Now, we, we still need to conform, we need to follow the rules, we need to not break any laws and all of that. But if everybody has that habit of innovation, that personal brilliance, and they come together and we harness that properly, now we can do great, extraordinary things. And that's really the idea behind it. So, you know, I guess we need the, you know, the mundane jobs and we need the, uh, you know, we, we need people to do the government work, if you will, with the quotes around it, right? But even then, you know, there's a mailman that's doing some innovative things, right? There's a janitor that's, that's doing some innovative things. It's up to all of us. Everybody has a stake in this. And that's the perspective that I take with innovation. Now, we tend to say, well, we have the operation going in our company and we want to carve out innovation and put it in a separate building and have an innovation building, room, campus, whatever. And all the ideas will ah, I'm not sure about that. Now, we may need to do that to break through the, the situation that you described, but wouldn't it be better if all 10,000 employees were innovative rather yeah. than just the 50 that you put on off campus in a different building? It's, it's a mindset. It's a way of thinking about it. Could be a little scary from a leadership perspective, but we're talking about leading and, and moving forward, not necessarily getting through the day. That's not our goal, right? So I can see that. My, uh, my two favorite bosses in all my working career for other people were both large corporations, and they were very innovative, fostered it, encouraged it, um, and just, just were great bosses. And I could see the difference between them and everyone else. You mentioned, you, uh, you mentioned the, even the mailman can be innovative. That reminds me of that Mark Sanborn book, something about Fred. I forget the title. Yeah, Mark's, a, Mark's a friend of mine, sure. Oh, that's a great book. And it's about, I mean, it stems from his mailman being service oriented. Uh, right. it's, it's just a great book, as are yours. So let's go back to yours. What types of companies do you deal with? Well, uh, Ron, I, I predominantly work with large companies. Um, the characteristics, for example, for our change leadership software are companies with a thousand employees and above. Uh, that that happens to be where I work, or I have worked in the past, and and um, you know in the companies it, it, I, I work with the areas of the organization where change happens. So some many times, often in IT, in the strategy area, those the, those types of areas. Um, but by design, though, we're a small business, and so I like that. Uh, dichotomy that that difference between the two so that I can work on those big huge problems but then translate them to the everyday and and the small and I guess like I did with innovation bring it down to the individual you know mm -hmm. so um, you know I just I, I tend to not have the opportunity to work with smaller companies but especially given the the tech startup which we'll talk about I guess in a little bit um, I've gotten involved with with high tech startup, high growth kind of companies who may have one or two employees, the founder and, and somebody else. And so I've been exposed to that as well. Uh, and, and I think the, the key connecting point through all of that is growth and growing. And if you're growing, I wanna work with you uh, and I wanna spend some time with you. So that's, that's the idea behind, uh, behind my approach, at least as far as that goes. That's great. Um, you mentioned keynoting a couple of times. What type of audience does, audiences do you speak in front of? Well, think in terms of leadership, for example, inside a corporation, the top 700 managers will get together for their annual planning thing. I, I would tend to be the speaker for that type of event where we're kicking off initiatives, the year, getting things moving. Um, also, uh, some association work as well. Um, last week, I spoke, for example, on, on strategic, strategically navigating turbulent times 
for an agricultural business association with a few hundred people in the audience, right? So it, it, that's, that's the perspective I take in, in speaking. Um, but uh, the innovative theme, the growing theme, the, 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 the change work, I tend to do more uh, individually, more working with small groups of people when we're talking about methodologies for leading change and so on. That's more of a bottom-up kind of a perspective where some of the innovation work and leadership work is, is, is a top-down perspective. And so we can gather people together to, to, to work on that that way. So it's quite a variety. And I think you can see, I, I like to do something different, a little different every single day. Uh, it keeps, keeps me uh, hopping and, and engaged with what I'm doing. Probably, I know it keeps me fresh, so I can appreciate yeah, that. Exactly. So right. tell us about the leadership concept of the new leadership normal. Uh, you focus on boundaries. Right, right. Well, you know, with, with change leadership, with innovation, it's all leadership. Really, when you think about it, when it, when it comes down to. And, you know, we tend to hear, um, you know, we know if, if we have a company of any size or scope, we're gonna start building departments. There's the marketing department, there's the technical department, there's the sales department, there's the manufacturing department. And, and they tend to uh, build silos, right? They, they become self-sufficient uh, in, in, in department by department and category by category. We tend to hear advice that says, let's break down those silos. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's the right answer. Uh, we mm -hmm. need those silos. They're organized the way they're organized for a reason. Um, now, would we love it if the sales, the head, VP of sales and the VP of marketing weren't trying to kill each other every day, right? <laughs> okay. we, we want them to get along better. And so one of the things from a leadership standpoint, and, and, I, and I, I call it the new leadership normal because I, I think you mentioned you had a couple leaders that were great, but it wasn't all of them. Uh, yeah. Great leadership isn't normal. Yeah. And, so, and so a big basis of, of the um, boundaries because I believe that we have to find a way as leaders to be able to successfully cross those boundaries and cross back. So the, the silos stay, the boundaries stay, but we need to be able to navigate and move amongst them so that when we hear a good idea from the marketing group, the sales group can support it, even if it means giving some resources up to marketing, because we know we're all working for the same thing. So that's, that's keeping the silos and the benefits of those, those groupings, but being able to traverse and go back and forth and, and be working for the holistic uh, benefit of, of the overall. That's, a, it sounds simple, but it's such a huge challenge. Yeah. And so when we work with leadership teams, we're working on that predominantly. And it's amazing how many problems get solved, how many symptom type things start to go away or fall away when we can learn to traverse those different boundaries. And so that to me is the new leadership normal. If we could make great leadership the norm um, and the expectation, that's really what it's all about. And that's the perspective that we take. The art and discipline of leadership and, and making, making uh, it a study and a capability, a competency uh, throughout organizations. And, and as we know, it's not everywhere and we need to make it everywhere. That's, <laughs> that's the idealistic hope uh, of that work. Well, that sounds pretty revolutionary. And speaking of revolutionary, your latest venture constituent hub is I think an attempt at creating a bit of a revolution. You use the phrase changing the way we lead change. Let's talk about that. Yeah, our, our software constituent hub was, was born as a frustration of mine. Um, a bit of stamping my foot and saying, darn it, let's fix this thing. Uh, <laughs> years ago, we wrote a, a, I call it my baby, it's a 9.8 pound uh, methodology for leading change, you know, very procedural. And, um, and so I, uh, for many years now, have worked with my clients to implement that methodology, teach it to them, model it, um, work with them and have them institute it within their organization so that they lead change better. And, and most people, most lay people don't really understand all that's involved. You, you think in terms of, oh, well, that's just communication or that's just training. We stand up everybody and train them and done. Um, kumbaya, everybody get together. It's a human resources <laughs> right. kind of thing. And uh, very far from the truth, of course, but, but that's okay. Uh, but so our methodology is there. 
and when I, you know, it came, all came from experience. Remember, I didn't realize there were academics about it. And so it all came from my experience. And, and what I did during my experience is I created software tools to help me do that work when, when I'm doing it, right? And so I knew that we needed some tools. It was very difficult to do all of those good change things on a spreadsheet or a cocktail napkin or keeping it in your head. Yeah. And so some of these relational databases uh, were, were important to me. But when I wrote the big book and I'm sharing that with my clients, there really wasn't a way to provide that software at that time, right? And so now with, with the, the advent of the cloud especially, it allows me to actually provide that. You know, a little old me can create enterprise software, right, <laughs> for big companies. And, and so because of that possibility, I finally said, darn it, we have to fix this because we're, we've institutionalized not doing the right things. What I mean by that is you don't even get in trouble for not doing the right things. And you don't do the right things because they're too hard to do. Yeah. You know, it's difficult to even find out who works here in our big company, right? Who, who are all the people that work here? And, and so because I don't know who they all are, I'm gonna treat them as this big blob and I'm gonna treat them all the same. Well, that's exactly the wrong way to lead change, right? But we, we do that and we're okay with it. We've institutionalized doing it incorrectly. And so that's the revolution part of it. So if you think about change in your company and say, well, we're gonna jam it in and if people die, I don't care, let's just move forward. <laughs> you're probably not gonna utilize Constituent Hub. But if you're saying, there's gotta be a better way. And we, we pay the price repeatedly for not doing the right things. Is there a way to do the right things? And, and that's where our Constituent Hub comes in and where our, our software comes in. And you know, I, I wanna fix that. And so um, that's, that's really what it's about. But it's creating a market to a certain extent, and that's part of the revolution. You, know, you don't even know that this exists. There, aren't, uh, there, aren't, there are tools that do bits and pieces, but there isn't a comprehensive tool like constituent what like con, what constituent hub represents and so that's um you know we're we're banging our head against the marketplace to a certain extent but it's innovation that's that's the name of the game it's it's not, not supposed to be easy right i'm in cybersecurity. i understand banging your head against the marketplace everybody mm -hmm. thinks it's the other guy that's going to get hacked not them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um i guess with constituent hub i'm still trying to get my arms around it inside a company who would use it how would it flesh that out for us? Sure, sure. The day-to-day the -day users of Constituent Hub are the people who lead the change. Now, it's difficult because in every company, it's a little bit different. Some companies are, are large and mature enough that they actually have a change leadership group, um, an OCM group, organizational change management. Uh, and, and so there, there are specific people that do that. Now, the problem with that, just to diverge a little bit, is there's usually one or two people in the whole company that are in that group. And so they don't do good work for everybody. <laughs> uh, so it, it, in the case, in that case, the, the organizational change people would be the user of Constituent Hub. It may be a project manager. It may be a product manager, depending on, on the strategy. Every company is a little bit different. But those are the people that have the tab for Constituent Hub open on their browser all day long. They're doing all of their work there. We can talk about some of the functionality of the system, but it does everything along those lines from communication um, to, to uh, stakeholder analysis to uh, change impact analysis, all of those different functions. So everything that that person does during the day is done in Constituent Hub. Also, the executive team is using Constituent Hub from an insight perspective. So being able to see all of the changes across the enterprise and then see a heat map of who's being affected by those changes. And you know, we, we, we get that question, well, they're just burnt out. We wanna hold back and not, uh, you know, not bother that group because they've been so beat up by so many changes. That's a gut thing. That's a feeling that we might have. That's not based on any fact. We don't have a way to even capture that. With Constituent Hub, we do. And so think about the executives looking at, let's see this area of the company and see what's going on in that area of the company. And then let's look at individual people and see what they're involved in throughout the organization because we might wanna tap that resource to, to do something and we wanna know that ahead of time. 
those are the kinds of things that, that we can do with constituent ops. So we have that top level user and then we have that day to day user. Um, and communication is coming out of Constituent Hub, so everybody in the company is receiving information via uh, Constituent Hub. And then as they give feedback to the changes they're experiencing, that's housed in Constituent Hub as well. And so it, it's definitely an integrated and, and um, intertwined piece of software that's it's woven into the fabric of everything we do all day long. In, in it sounds tremendous. It sounds like it's an instant feedback, instant communication tool that keeps everybody on the same page while yeah, and, encouraging innovation. Yeah. And Ron, I think, you know, the uh, one way I describe it is when I have a conversation with you in March about mm -hmm. the change coming up towards the end of the year, I would like to use that conversation in your language and your requirements, what you want in November when I talk to you again. And if I have you in a spreadsheet someplace <laughs> or a notepad that I'm taking notes for our conversation back in March, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so with, with this integrated tool, we have the better chance of doing it right. Uh, and, and, you know, to be able to, to break things down, what I, what I call uh, customization at scale. So we don't need to tr treat the entire IT department the same way as the four security analysts that are in the IT department who mm -hmm. need some special attention or something described to them a certain way, or they might be attending a unique and special class only for them in the yeah. training that goes along with the change. Those are the kinds of things that, that we can do with a tool like this. And so not being able to do those big frustration for me and my clients. And again, that's what I want to fix. And that's, that's what we're doing with constituent. That's, that's just great. We're going to continue uh, on with that after uh, just a short break. Uh, folks, you're listening to Chatting with Ron. This is a program that focuses on people doing amazing things, and we're talking to an amazing gentleman right now, Jim Cantarucci, which we'll continue in a moment. You could be listening to us on radio, WVLP-FM. That's in Valparaiso, Indiana, 103.1 on your FM dial. We're on Monday mornings and Friday afternoons. Uh, if you're uh, if you're in if you're in that area, 103.1 FM might be convenient, but I always encourage folks to stream it. And you can go to the uh, website wvlp.org to do that. It's uh, it's a great radio station. They do a lot for the community, and and I hope you get involved. I hope you uh, I hope you check out their website, and maybe you can be a part of their involvement, part of help them. Um, we're also on well, I, I think on just most of the podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcast, um, there's at least a half a dozen more after that. Um, check us out there and check out the video on, uh, on YouTube. All of it's under Chatting with Ron. I'm Ron Bush with Ron Bush Consulting, and you can check out my website at ronbushconsulting.com. We're in cybersecurity. And we help businesses uh, stay safe on, on the internet uh, or actually stay safe period. You've got to worry about social engineering and all kinds of nasty things nowadays. Jim, would, uh, is there a way that folks uh, can, uh, can get in touch with you? Jim uh, uh, Cantarucci is our guest and we're talking about Constituent Hub. How would you like people if they've got questions or need further help or assistance? How would they get in touch with you? Sure, Ron. The, the, the best way is through our website and it's my name, jimcantarucci.com. That's Jim, C-A-N-T-E-R-U-C-C-I.com. And uh, if you're interested in Constituent Hub, it's got its own website, constituenthub.com. So there's two different avenues and all kinds of contact buttons that you can reach me uh, from those websites. So that's the best way. Great. Um, so uh, let's, get back to, uh, let's get back to business here. Every tool, great tool or product, must solve a business problem. So what does Constituent Hub solve? Great question. We, we see research, Ron, that up to 70% of change initiatives fail. Wow. Yeah. Really, if that's true, there is no hope. I mean, why, why do we even wake up to do what we do? 70%. Uh, of course, it depends on how you measure it. But I you think know, the numbers. If I can interrupt for just yeah, a second, yeah. when you were talking about mergers and acquisitions earlier, the ones you hear about are the ones that just really go south, and sometimes they go south really fast. When you're talking about that much change, 
I mean, yeah, it's going to be hard for people to adapt. So 70% though, I didn't realize it was that high. Yeah. And, and I, I, it seems high to me as well. I, I you know, that, it depends on how you measure that, that success or failure. You know, did we meet every single characteristic versus we shuttered the change initiative and said, forget it. And we lost $10 million. We just threw that away uh, and wrote it off. I don't know what the measurement of failure is. I think it varies all over the place with these statistics by the big consulting firms, right? <laughs> but I, if, if I, just based on my experience, I think the number's probably closer to a failure rate of about 45%. That's still huge. That's millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? And so something that we want to avoid. Now, remember, we think, I don't know why, but I don't know what the psychology is behind, is it behind this, but given that kind of an impact, we still think that leading change is, oh, well, it's just the way it is, mm -hmm. right? Almost like there's no chance of it getting us getting better. It's just business as usual. We'll just keep doing the same thing over and over again, and hopefully we won't fail this time, right? Ah, it sounds like a strange way to go about things, right? Um, you know, I, I think a company works really hard to develop a strategy in their marketplace, and the strategy has objectives. And most times, one objective leads to the next step-by-step -step building kind of approach as, as we have these strategic objectives. So we're going to get this done this quarter, and then when it's done, we're going to do the next thing, and then, you know, we build it. So that's typically how it works. And, and if strategic objective one isn't adopted or achieved, likely the whole strategy falls apart. Mm. So why did we go to that resort and do that? you know, planning thing with the high price consulting firm to come up with a strategy if we don't pay any attention to how we're going to actually adopt the changes that result from the strategy. So strategic objectives generate change. We have to do something differently in order to adopt that change, right? Let's say our strategy calls for increasing revenue in the North uh, Pacific Northwest by 3%. Well, we can't just do the same thing that we did last year or we aren't going to get that revenue increase. So that's a change. What if we don't adopt the change? Guess what? We don't get the 3% bump and the strategy falls apart, right? And so that's, that's the problem area that we're working on. How can we more successfully adopt the changes so that we could actually realize our strategy? And if we can, are confident we can realize the strategy, we can move forward faster, more effectively uh, with what we're trying to accomplish as an organization. So much of what we do is replanning because we didn't meet the strategic objective because we didn't adopt the change. And, and, uh, and, and that work is just a lot of wasted work uh, that we could probably avoid. So it's, it's a, an efficiency perspective. Um, and and that's, that's what we're looking for. So everything we do with Constituent Hub is designed to make change adoption uh, a competency for the company so that we're actually good at doing that. And there's an expectation on the front lines of how things should work. Um, our, our clients who do this well, if you go to uh, a small team on the manufacturing floor uh, or a nurse's station in a hospital uh, and you, you say, Here's gonna, there's going to be a change, they'll say something like, what's the foundation for change for this new project that you have? I wanna understand the why of what we're doing because that, they have a competency in doing this well. And they know if that isn't there, then this thing isn't gonna go very well. And they're actually testing the change leaders to make sure they're on top of things. That's, that's what we're looking for. And there's a good chance that we're gonna adopt the change in that area than if we were just saying, hey, something new, uh, get used to it, uh, just be quiet and do what I tell you, right? <laughs> that, that perspective. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, like, as I mentioned, for the first time, we can see all the changes across the enterprise. We have a better insight and perspective. We also could see for an individual, let's say we look at Ron's uh, record and we see that Ron's involved in seven change initiatives. Wow, that's a lot. I wonder mm -hmm. why. Well, oh, he's in charge of operations. That makes perfectly good sense. Now, perhaps we want to get Ron some help because he's really busy. But also I want to ask the question, 
there are 12 change initiatives going on, why is he only involved in seven? What are we missing? I don't have those insights today. So those are the types of, of things that, that we're solving with Constituent Hub so that we move to a change adoption competency, which has a direct tie to realization of strategy. So that's where we're playing. This is a, a bit boring, a little bit under the covers and behind the scenes, but could be all the difference for creating that championship team, that dynasty versus just getting by and leaking, you know, failure after failure and not realizing that strategy. So that's, that's where we're at, trying to increase that competency. And, you know, you're simply better as a result with that competency and all the buzzwords like engagement and communication and innovation, they, they all are, are addressed mm -hmm. by this competency. It sounds to me like, uh, I, I don't know if you've read the book, I, I think it's called Start With Questions. And it's basically, uh, I remember years ago, I, I uh, read a Tom Hopkins book, How to Master the Art of Selling Anything. And his point was to lead with questions. It's the art of asking questions and knowing when to ask them and, and how to ask them that I think really moves us forward in just about any game. And and you mentioned all the things that you look at. You know, Ron's involved in in seven things. Well, why is that? Is you know, is he just weird or hard to get along with or what? Or and then you discover, oh, there's twelve of them going on now. Why is he in? Because he's a COO. He, he's involved in seven makes sense, but what about the other five? If, it's if that there, Ron. If there's twelve change initiatives going on and there's 12 different people leading them and they're each using a different version of a different kind of spreadsheet based on what they think might be important how could you possibly get the answer to that question you just can't yeah. right and, and so that's what i mean by it meant earlier when i said we've institutionalized not doing it the right way yeah. <laughs> you know, it, just, it can't possibly happen correctly yeah and it's no accident by the way the curiosity is one of the four catalysts of personal brilliance. So it all does tie together for sure. The questions are so important. So in my experience, a lot of people don't really understand all that's involved with leading change. What are some of the things that fit under the umbrella that they may not realize? Well, we mentioned one earlier, uh, for example, uh, the foundation for change. The foundation for change is, and I'll describe it this way, It's an, it's an ugly one page document, but it, it defines the why of the change. And so it talks about why we're doing it, the tie to strategy of the organization, so important, the metrics that we're going to use or to measure success or failure with this change, what change we're going to have. So let's say your team was responsible for X percent of, of uh, uh, expense uh, control. What does this change do? How does it change that metric? So we have that in the foundation for change and then basically the approach. And we actually use that as, um, as a way to communicate as well. We repeat that foundation for change over and over again because like the rings on a tree, as our change initiative gets bigger, we introduce new people. They have to get on board with what we're doing and we're, we're usually moving pretty fast. And so the foundation for change is a way to do it. So if you, had, if you were gonna stand up in front of your team and explain with a PowerPoint slide what was going on, the first three slides would be the foundation for change. But the act of building that and getting the buy-in and clarity from executives from leaders around the company uh, happens when you're building the foundation for change. So that's something that's part of the methodology and, and really makes the magic happen. We talked about identifying uh, all of the people that are affected by the change. And we have a thing we call con constituent reach. And that's where, and by the way, I changed the word that you might be familiar with, stakeholder. I changed the word to constituent. And it implies, oh, yeah. that change in, in word uh, just implies that we actually care about the people and we're going to take care of them. We worry about them. The reason we're doing this is be, so the constituent can actually do their work more successfully because of the change that we're implementing. And it's a whole different perspective. So if I'm thinking about the constituent, then I can look at all of the people that are affected, and I can say these people are affected by this change, these people are, I bring them in, and then I begin to care for them. I analyze what their perspectives are. I break them into manageable uh, groups 
so that I could work with them. And I know that the billing group has to pay attention to something a little di bit different than the manufacturing group or the um, marketing team. And I'm gonna then treat them differently. Uh, and so that constituent reach is part of an, an analysis, is part of the methodology. And then we do something called change impact analysis. That's looking at the most granular way we can, all of the changes that are involved, we list them out. But one change item, Let's say we're implementing, for example, a new uh, customer relationship management system, a new CRM across the board. One change would be we have to record in the CRM when we have a contact with a customer, right? Something we might not have done before. So therefore it's a change. It belongs on the list. Now that change for the customer service rep, same change for the marketing department person, same change for the salesperson, they, each of those three different groups of people or types of people will react differently. Some may love this change, some may hate it. And mm -hmm. our reaction to, to that, how we're going to address and support those constituents properly happens in change impact analysis. And it may, for all of the changes for implementing that one small little computer system in our company may involve six or 700 tasks around leading change. In our system, they go on a Kanban board and we keep track of them, assign those resources, and we know the work that we need to do. So change impact analysis actually tells us what's happening. That's what fuels all the behind the scenes magical artwork that's happening <laughs> that nobody realizes is happening. That's where it's coming from. And it might involve communication, special training, getting people involved in testing, uh, communication uh, across different boundaries, putting people together. Those are the types of tricks then, the art of change leadership that happens because we know what to do based on the changes. And then one thing that we often forget is something we call change readiness. And that is, we, we typically say, are you, are you trained? So, so Ron, did you go to your training class? Did you learn how to type in this computer system? And so therefore you're ready to go. Okay, it's the night before, are we ready? Sure, go, right? Um, and, and I don't really, I'm not too concerned that you went to your training class and were stayed awake during it. What I wanna know is can you do your job in the changed environment, right? And so we wanna test for change readiness and we wanna, so therefore I need to know who you are. I need to know what your job is and what your key contribution to the company is because I want to make sure that we test that you can still contribute in that way. So to give you an example, a horror story, uh, one company we know implemented SAP, the ERP system, right? Mm -hmm. And when they went forward with it on that Monday morning, everything was great. But then they discovered that they could not bill their customers. And that went on for like three months. This is oh, a two and a half billion dollar company. So think about the impact of that. Yeah. Because they, they said, ah, you know what? Everybody's ready to go. They're all happy and, and they went to training. Everybody knows what's happening. We tested the system. It'll be great. Sure. But then they didn't test for change readiness. They didn't, you know, and what happens, when, what happens when we find out we couldn't do the billing? Well, we might still go live that same day, but we now know where we need to work, where we need help, where we need support, et cetera. So change readiness is a big piece. And again, if all the other components of the methodology didn't happen, you can't do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and so th those are some of the intricacies of change leadership that a lot of people don't, don't realize are even there. It's, they, they might see it only at the end or be affected by a change coming at them and they wonder who the nuts are uh, at headquarters that are managing this thing, you know. Uh, and, and that's a result of not implementing all of those pieces parts of the methodology. And those are the things that um, we can get everybody apples to apples with Constituent Hub because they're all working from the same playbook um, and, and doing all of those little tiny things that um, could be huge, huge amounts of work and make a big impact uh, throughout Excellent. the organization. Excellent. So um, when we come back, I want to talk about your uh, morning email and I want to talk uh, about any, I guess, any great change leaders that you've known or that that you've you've uh, that you know from history. They don't have to be contemporary, but if there are some, I would love to hear about those. And uh, and then I want to get into uh, in again into your uh, into your morning email. That seems uh, uh, 
uh, interesting to me. I may sign up for it. But uh, first off, you're listening to Chatting with Ron. That's a program that focuses on people doing amazing things with their lives. And again, we've got a great guest today that exemplifies that, Jim uh, Cantarucci. Um, chatting with Ron's on uh, Valparaiso uh, FM, uh, 103.1 FM or WVLP.org. I hope that you check them out on their website. I hope you check out Chatting with Ron either on podcast uh, channels or platforms rather like uh, Spotify or uh, Apple Podcast. We're on quite a few of them. Google Podcast. There's uh, again, there's about half uh, half a dozen more of those. Uh, we're also on uh, uh, YouTube under the ch- on the channel Chatting with Ron. So I hope you uh, hope you catch us. I hope you like us. If you do, subscribe. Uh, with that, our guest is uh, Jim Cantarucci. Jim, uh, give them your uh, your website again, or how you want folks to contact you. I think it's probably your website, isn't it? Sure, Jim Jim Cantarucci dot com. Jim Cantarucci dot com, uh, and uh, to learn more about Constituent Hub, Constituent Hub dot com. In both cases, Ron, uh, those websites have a ton of content, so you have the ability to traipse through and uh, pick up as much as you'd like. So, Jim Cantarucci dot com, Constituent Hub dot com. ConstituentHub.com has a video that goes into things. And of course, videos can explain things graphically. We live in that kind of a world. So uh, uh, I think that's an excellent tool for people to understand more about what you're doing. I think you may have, I don't know if you have a video on your, I forget. You have a video on your. Yeah, there's video everywhere. (laughs) Yeah, that's a nicely done website. Very nice. Um, So at the very front of it or top of it, it talks about, an email that you can get on Saturday morning. So what is this all about? What is your Saturday morning mail? Sure, Ron. I, um, I write every day. It's an exercise for me. But um, I do work with leaders every single week. And I, what I do is I write about lessons learned with those leaders and try to be, bring my readers into those situations in order to expand their experience and knowledge. So it's as if you're sitting with me as I'm sitting with a CEO talking about the kinds of things that we deal with, innovation, change, and um, the new leadership normal. So we chose Saturday mornings to send the message uh, via email. Now it's an email. Um, It arrives at 6 a.m. in the morning on Saturday for a very specific reason, but It's okay. You don't have to wake up at six o'clock in the morning. It's an email. You can read it later. But what I found was as leaders, we tend to be taking care of everybody else, right? And we're busy all week long taking care of everybody else. And we tend to wake up early on Saturday morning and get our work done on Saturday morning. And the idea is that I just want to kick you off first thing in the morning on Saturday morning (laughs) before you do that work with some good leadership information. The email's short, it's 300 to 600 words, and there's a to-do for next week uh, on that particular topic. So if you look at it, it's a, it's a coaching guide throughout the whole year, bringing the new leadership normal and the concepts of creating that championship team and that dynasty that we, you and I have been talking about for the last hour uh, on a weekly basis. And uh, I don't ever, ever, ever sell anything. Um, but really the, the best part uh, for me is the back and forth that happens because as, as a reader um, sees their own situation, they, they reply back to me and I, I, can, I spend a day just going back and forth with our readership talking about their situations. And so uh, if, if your uh, listeners would be interested in that, we'd love to have you join the, join the community. And if you go to jimcantarucci.com, it's, it's hard to miss. There are buttons everywhere to sign up for that. <laughs> uh, so, so please do and, and look for it every Saturday morning. And you could uh, take the weekend off and read it on Monday if you need to. So there you that's, go. That's what that's about. So you've worked with a lot of great leaders, I'm sure. And I, I, I love history. I, do, I, read, I read about 100 books a year, right between 80 and 100 on any given year. And I, uh, I love to read stories biography stories of what people have done so uh, we've got a few minutes do you have any uh, any thoughts any leaders that and again uh, you know your clientele they may be embarrassed if you uh, if you mm-hmm. sing their praises on a video so uh, I'll leave it with you but do you have anyone in mind that you might tell well, us about yeah you know, Ron when the leaders of change who do it very well are 
unsung heroes by definition. And so uh, many of the names I might mention, you may not, nobody would recognize, right? Um, but if you look back in history, uh, and, and I think the famous ones, the famous stories, really ge are generated from the innovation piece because we're interested in innovation and it's good, it's good PR, good publicity to talk about innovation. One story that, that strikes me or pops into mind is um, Franklin Roosevelt uh, during World War II. And um, it, it's about curiosity and asking what if questions. At the time, diamonds were very important to the war buildup effort, uh, industrial diamonds, being able to cut steel and so on to build all of the war machinery. Well, the De Beers um, organization uh, controlled the diamond market, just like they do today. And for some reason during World War II, the um, Germans got all of the diamonds and the Allies didn't have access to them. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just part of the, the war effort. And so Franklin Roosevelt asked the what if question, what if, we could make diamonds in a factory. What if we could do the same things that, that the earth does, the compression uh, under the earth and make diamonds in a factory? He asked that what if question and about five miles away from me right now in Columbus, Ohio, uh, is that first factory that's still in place, uh, still in play today, making industrial diamonds. And so uh, that what if question could change the world, right? Uh, but we're doing that in companies. There are leaders in companies every single day and frontline people in companies every day asking those kinds of questions. And then, of course, implementing the change. <laughs> if, 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 if he asked that question and everybody said, sure, great idea, and then nobody did anything, uh, we wouldn't <laughs> have that innovation, right? And so, uh, you know, that's everything encapsulizes kind of everything we've been talking about uh, in this hour, so that's Excellent. that's one story that uh, I that I that's dear to me because I was able to tour that factory, and public tours are not allowed because literally they're <laughs> bombs. They have bomb suits inside, you know, <laughs> to protect themselves. It's not necessarily safe, uh, but uh, you know we have that kind of ingenuity as human beings, and to see that innovation at play and to see the implementation of the resulting changes and uh, strategic initiatives getting accomplished and companies being successful, and therefore the people that work there being successful uh, is, is what it's all about. And so that's, that's where you and I like to play, and uh, I'm glad we were able to spend this time together to do that. Me too, Jim. It's, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. And I hope that, uh, I hope that people will, uh, will run out and buy you, your books. Uh, you've, uh, you've written a lot of great, of great uh, stuff, and, you've, <laughs> and you, have, you do so much in I guess on online as well as uh, in your your keynote uh, talks, uh, you seem to do it all, and uh, it's been a pleasure meeting you and having you on today. I look forward to doing it in the flesh, so to speak. But it's been great having you on the program. Sounds good for you, Ron, and everybody listening. Don't forget, you're brilliant, <laughs> and I wrote the book, so it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jim, and thank, thank you, you everyone for listening to chatting with Ron. Um, tune us in. We're uh, available on podcast. We're available on YouTube. And if you're in Valparaiso, Indiana, we're available there. So uh, tune us in. Let us know what you think. You can contact me off the Ron Bush Consulting website, uh, Jim off the Jim Cantarucci website. And again, that's C-A-N-T-E-R-U-C-C-I. Uh, Bush is B-U-S-H. So either one of those websites, uh, check us out. Let us know what you think. Have a great day.